Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. Here's the thing, like now as an adult, I can harness that superpower and I can use it to achieve things that a lot of people would think a homeschooling mom of six couldn't do. And I've actually found that, you know, being a mom, is not a handicap for me. Um, it's actually my secret superpower because I'm willing to work harder and longer, research deeper, and, you know, network more than anybody else is willing to because I have a lot on the line. And yeah. a lot of times as mothers, we're kind of given that message that you can't be ambitious and the mom. You can't do both. I've actually found that that's, that's my superpower. You're listening to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, a podcast for those who are in and around the hospitality industry who love, live, and breathe what they do. You can join us for candid and unscripted conversations with hospitality experts and founders as we go deeper into their personal stories while they're sharing their triumphs and trials that got them to where they are today. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and you're listening to an episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now, let's begin. All right, Nathan, welcome back to A Minute with Minute on Slick Talk. And we're going to jump into the question today of what is the biggest misunderstanding when it comes to what Minute does and doesn't do? Great question, Will. I, I think the biggest misunderstanding is probably that we do more than just noise. Uh, I know we'll cover that in another Minute with Minute. So for now, I'm going to major specifically on the noise feature itself. Many people think that we can let you know when there's noise in your unit and that's the end. But what we can actually do uh, with our pro account is import the data for your guests when they're staying, what's their phone number, et cetera, and then allow you to automate communication with that guest when there's a noise event. So what we hear from many of our users is after sending even one text message to the guests, letting them know that there's noise, they tend to quiet down because they don't realize that they're being noisy. So in many cases, if you use our automation, you may actually resolve the problem with no input from yourself, just an automated message from the system asking them to quiet down, and then the noise issue is over. I love it. You heard it here first, folks. A minute with minute, and now back to the episode. All right, Slick Talkers, we are back, and this is a episode that's been in the making, and way overdue just fyi i will take 100 uh, percent as rose knows that i am the, probably the worst responder on social media but rose you Hello. are finally here welcome to the yeah. podcast how are Thank you doing you. today i'm doing great um it was actually warm today which is nice the sun was out the plants are coming out so hopefully here in the midwest we'll be able to get going with spring that would be nice yeah yeah <laughs> it'd be nice to defrost a little bit i think we all we all could agree with that Yes. I am excited to have you on. You and I got to meet in person for the first time after getting to know of each other through, I believe, the Boostly Slack group, social yeah. media, you know, all the all the places. Uh, we got to meet at the Level Up Your Listing Summit with Natalie and Tatiana that they got to put on, which was awesome. And it was so good to meet you in person and get to hear, you know, the story behind you and just kind of get to meet you in person. And so I'm glad we actually waited post conference. Mm -hmm season one because we have probably two or three seasons of conferences this year but i love to start and just go into kind of what's your story in the sense of you know what's your background what eventually got you into this crazy industry we call vacation rentals mm -hmm. and hospitality and real estate all the above i would love to know your your journey <laughs> well thank you for having me on and you know things happen at the right time and now is the right time for us to to be doing the podcast so when I meet people in the vacation rental industry or at podcasts, I always stick my hand out and I go, I'm a homeschooling mom of six. <laughs> um, and I haven't met any other people like that in 
the vacation rental industry. And if you are that person, please reach out to me because we clearly need to be best friends. Uh, so I actually have a background in education. I have a master's in secondary science education. So what that word salad means was that I was a high school science teacher at a small rural high school for a few years before we started a family. And uh, so I'm definitely a science geek. I love math. So I'm the go-to for math. I get excited about numbers and, and all that kind of stuff. But when we started a family, my husband and I made a decision that he was going to continue on in his company, in his industry, and that I was going to be staying home with our kids. I told him I would have one, and now we have six. Mm -hmm. So that, <laughs> that worked out real nice. Um, but we had decided that I was going to be home with the kids, and I was very excited about that opportunity for me. I'd always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and I certainly enjoyed doing that. And we came fast forward a little bit into the mom journey, and we have four kids, and my husband is working his job you know, doing his traditional stuff. And it's not really something that's fulfilling him, but it's providing for our family. And that's mm -hmm. great. Unfortunately, we had a big life event that happened. My husband was on the way to a work conference. He was driving and he was in a very bad car accident. Now he's okay. Everybody can <laughs> relax. He's fully recovered. But he was in, he was in a very bad car accident. Um, he was hit head on by another car at full speed. He broke his ribs. His sternum was pushing back into his heart. He was having a cardiac concussion. He had a major concussion in his brain, and that concussion actually caused him to lose his memory. And so he was at the hospital, but he could not tell the people at the hospital who he was, any of his medical history, nothing. His phone and his wallet were still in our vehicle, and uh, it took them a few hours of intense detective work to figure out who this man was. They called me, said, your husband's been in a car accident and you need to come here immediately. Um, they wouldn't tell me if he was alive. So I had, we had four kids. The youngest was a baby, put the baby in the car seat, dropped the other three kids off at the neighbor and drove down to the hospital, not knowing what I was going to find there. But he- Can I ask you? Yes. What was going through your head through that whole- I can't even imagine yeah. just like getting that phone call for a loved one in, in general. So what was going through your head on the way to the hospital while you have your newborn in the backseat? Yeah. Well, there's two thoughts and they, they kind of run in parallel. The first one is I'm not going to freak out and I'm going to hold it together. There's mm -hmm. that voice that we have in our head that pushes us on. And that voice comes to me at times in my life when I really need it. I mean, that voice told me you, you were going to hold it together because your husband needs you. You're going to hold together. And then the other voice said, we're all going to therapy afterwards. So that's sort of a compromise I make <laughs> is I'm going to hold it together in these intense, stressful situations, but we're definitely going to go to therapy afterwards. I felt <laughs> confident that he was alive because I didn't think that if he was dead, they would have told me that I needed to hurry. So that was my calculation. But that was the two sides is that you have to hold it together. You can't be a mess. He needs you to fix this. And you will deal with the repercussions in the future. So that's what my brain's telling me. When he was recovering, he told me that he was not going to die on the way to a work conference, that that was not going to be his life. He couldn't mm -hmm. do it. He couldn't do it anymore. And that we needed to renegotiate, renegotiate the structure. At that point, I was not going to be going back into teaching. That was not on my journey. And he was in the process of recovery. And so I needed to figure it out. I needed to figure out something that was going to support our family, that was going to give us the time together that we needed. But I was unwilling to compromise on whether I was going to homeschool our kids, stay home with them. I was going to have it all. I was going to do it all. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up with a piece of property that my husband bought. Sometimes, sometimes when people have concussions, they do things that are <laughs> sometimes at the time seem irrational. Um, yeah. And I was, I, this has really been my story for the last 15 years. I was pregnant again. I was pregnant with baby number five. <laughs> yeah, I don't drink the water here. <laughs> Heard a myrtle. And I was going to have a baby at any moment in time. And I know, well, you have not had a baby, but heads up, when you're about to have a baby, it's the only thing you can think of. There is no new information that you are willing to bring into your brain other than get this baby out of me. <laughs> um, my husband said, I think we should buy this property. It has a house on it. And I said, I'm pregnant. No, that was it. 
So he bought it. <laughs> so he um, did it anyways. So he bought it. I ha- actually had the baby the next day and he thought, it's probably not a good idea to tell Rose about this. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Wow. I know. It's yes. Without that concussion, he would have been in the doghouse for <laughs> probably a good amount of time, huh? Oh, well, I, I had a close friend of mine that I was talking to because I didn't find out for six weeks, to be honest with you. I didn't find out for six wow. weeks. Wow. I just had a baby. Like, yeah, I was, in, I was in a baby. And I was talking to a friend who is our real estate agent because we're in a small town. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows everybody. She said, we close on the property next week. And I said, what property? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't buy a property. That was how I found out. Well, I was talking to a friend of mine. I'm like, I can't believe he did this. And she said, well, are you going to divorce him? I said, no. She goes, then you have to get over it. So I got over it. <laughs> and so I got oh. over it. And it was sort of one of those, you know, here's my beer moments. And I was going to make it a success for our family. And that was how we fell into, crashed into vacation rentals. That seems to be the most common thing with everybody is that it's not that I chose to get into vacation rentals. I stumbled, I crashed, I fell, I barricaded through, uh, rampaged into whatever it might be uh, into vacation rentals. And I'm curious just to kind of backtrack a little bit for your story with all of this happening. And, you know, your husband comes up to you and says, you know, we need to renegotiate our structure here. Why not go back into schooling? What was driving you away from that? What, what what made you want to say, no, you have this master's degree. It, to me, it made natural sense for you to go that route instead of stumbling or waking up in six weeks post, <laughs> uh, post baby that you're, you have a property. Yeah. Well, first yeah. of all, we live in a community that is more rural. And honestly, teachers don't get paid much down here. Financially, it wasn't going to work for our family, especially compared to the salary that my husband was making at the time. And I came up with a lot of good ideas for him to do. He was in uh, a very specific industry that, and he had a lot of very specialized knowledge. And I'm like, I would hate to see that knowledge go to waste. Why don't you work for another company? Well, then I'd have less control over my schedule, which was true. I said, well, your lawyers call you with questions about this industry. Why don't you go to law school and I'll suck it up and I'll take care of everything and you can, you know, go go to law school. There's a school close by. And he's like, yeah, that would be great. And I do have this knowledge, but what I'm not going to get is more time with my kids because Mm. it's all very fleeting and our time is very limited. And I don't want to, you know, write off three years. And then lawyers, they work a lot of really crazy hours. That was not on his path for him. And he was very, he was very stuck. Um, For me, I loved being with my kids. I loved educating my kids. I loved learning alongside them. I loved reading all of my favorite books. You know, there's those books that you read when you were a kid that yeah. just make your heart smile. Well, I get to read those with my kids every day and it's it's the best. It's the best. I don't want to give that up. So I had to figure it out and failure was not going to be an option for me. So I plowed forward. I've been accused of being persistent. Uh, I would say I the one thing I've noticed with your personality, especially after getting to meet you in person, I was like, man. So for everyone who knows or doesn't know, maybe I don't have social media on my phone. I've banned from that and I have a social media app manager that I have to log in on my computer in order to like actually access my socials. I also when post my social media. Usually I'll do it on my desktop if I can do it through there, stuff like that. So going through messages and seeing all the stuff I'm horrible at seeing. And I did look back and I was like, man, Rose has been trying to get on the show for a while and i have completely just been like unaware of the amount of messages and you are a persistent person i've seen that in person when you want to meet somebody you have no fear of just going right up i'm rose i am a stay-at-home mom of six children not really a stay-at-home mom but you know the sense of like you are rose like you make a presence and it's a good presence i i would say most people probably would take something like that intimidating but for you, you kind of have like this really soft, but a persistent approach, which is is really actually refreshing in my opinion. But I can see how that applies to your your story in the sense of you have like that flight or flight kick in really kind of naturally came to you, mm-hmm. uh, especially not knowing. Granted, like, OK, if the hospital is, t- is telling you to hurry, yes, it's probably a good sign that there's life. But, mm-hmm. you know 
during that moment, I would still, I'd be bawling my eyes out. I would be, I think my flight mode would have kicked in. Yeah. I think we all have moments in our life and we, we wonder how we're going to act in those moments. Moments yeah. that are scary, moments where, you know, big things are online. And we always, we always kind of wonder how are we going to act in those situations. I haven't talked about this on one of the podcasts before, but one of, one of my children was born extremely prematurely. Mm. Um, and I had a, it was a, it was a disaster. Let's just put it that way. It was a disaster. And it was another one of those moments where, what am I going to do? And, and it was that two-way conversation. The, I have to hold it together for this tiny three-pound baby. And then I need to deal with it in the future. But in the moment right now, I have to hold it together for this little tiny baby. When they're three pounds, they don't have butt cheeks. Like it sounds <laughs> funny, but like they don't have any fat on them at three pounds. So they, their backs go right into their legs. Wow. And I hate to say that I have practiced <laughs> with dealing with tough situations, but we all do. We all have practice with that. Um, and so it's how you're able to respond in those situations is how you're going to come out the other side. Yeah. Your response for sure is the most important piece. So carry us through the story. You have this conversation with your realtor, who's your, also your friend, small town type type situation. Tells you, you close on this property in a week. Congratulations. You're not going to divorce your husband. You're going to, you're going to have this new plot of land in a, in a home. What then were, were you guys thinking long-term at all? Did you ever think like, oh, let's just rent it out or do we do this? Do you sell your current mm -hmm. house? Like what were the options? And then my question kind of following that is where does short-term rentals or vacation rentals get introduced to you? When do you hear about it through Airbnb, Verbo, some platform, or did you just kind of say, you know what, we get tons of tourism or we have some kind of tourism around. Let's use this as a, a money-making machine. Yeah. So the property that my husband bought, it's gorgeous. It's 19 acres. So it's not wow. a little postage stamp. It's it's 19 acres, but it also has two completely private lakes mm. on there. And there was a house that was in really bad shape, but we, it was, we'd be too small for our family. We have a lot of kids now. So we thought, well, we'll, we'll fix it up. I have a lot of experience project managing. I'm sure that comes as a surprise telling people what to do. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of experience with project managing construction because we'd done a lot of projects and I'd helped people out with that. But we wanted to be able to use the lake. And if we put like a long-term renter in there, we wouldn't have been able to just go over there and use the lake and swim and kayak and fish. And so if we were to use it as a vacation rental, when it wasn't occupied, we would be able to use it ourselves. That was sort of the initial thinking about it. So we had, you know, I had the cabin renovated and we started renting it out. And we're like, well, when we go on vacation, we'll go on Verbo, we'll go on Airbnb. And so we listed there. And it is very easy to list anything on those sites. And we weren't really sure if anybody would even come. But hey, we we had this investment and we were going to be able to enjoy it when we didn't have guests. Um, needless to say, a private lake is very popular. Yeah. Um, and, and some people like to go to lake houses and it, maybe it's a big lake and maybe there's a bunch of other homes. But we're talking a totally private lake in the middle of the woods. Like, and, and not to be not to be explicit, but I could wake up yeah. in the morning in my birthday suit, have a cup of coffee. Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. like yeah, like. it's that kind of a private <laughs> lake. Absolutely. Now, whenever I'm starting something new or I want to learn something new, I have I have a rule of three as I read or listen to at least three books on the topic. And if I haven't, if the books that I'm reading haven't referenced something I've already read, then I keep going. I'm not sure if that makes mm. sense. Like, yeah, yeah. Usually by the time you've read three books on a topic, the books that you're reading refer to other things you've already read. At that point, that's when I feel like I'm knowledgeable enough about something to put things into action. So that's, that's my yeah. rule of three. So I had stacks of books. And I sat at, at baseball practices with my highlighter, taking notes. I mean, there's a science teacher in me. I was in research mode and I was researching everything. I was listening to all the podcasts. I was reading all the books and somebody would mention a book. I'd go get it and I would read it. And one of the problems that I realized sort of early on with this particular property, it wasn't big enough for us to be able to charge appropriately 
for what we were offering. Like it was a small, it's like a 900 square foot house. It sleeps six people. We really can't charge the kind of rates that we would want to in order to get financial freedom for our family. So that made us think, how do we move into a niche that was going to be more profitable? One of the problems that our family always has is because we're such a big family is we can never find a home that was that's big enough for us. And so we thought, well, there's a lot of these little cabins around here. Let's do something big. So we went back to our friend, real estate agent, who is still our friend, uh, and she actually found an off market. It was it was um, it was going to be going on the market, but it was an estate sale. And she's like, "This this is what you're looking for, and you need to buy it right now before it hits the market." And it was it was exactly what we were looking for. And it is the property we have now called Mount Pleasant Lodge. And once we started with a big house, and we saw how much more we could charge for it. It made a lot more financial sense. And that is when we fully committed to these big homes that are specifically for multi-generational family travel. Mm. Uh, big homes are harder to to turn over, harder to manage. It's not difficult to market them, but it's different types of marketing, different types of yeah. guests. But that is where we have ended. Um, that is where we're focusing our brand is on these big homes that are on totally private acreage that you can walk around in your birthday suit. I'm not sure if you want to do that in front of your family, but, but you know, um, you know, to each I, I don't travel with my family. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll take a big house by myself and be like, ah, yeah, there we yes. go, freedom. And so that, so we were really trying to view it as, as guests ourselves is how do we make something that our own family would use? And we knew we couldn't find it for ourselves, And so we hoped that other people would too. And that's, that's how we ended up in our specific niche. I love that. And uh, to make a point, I love, there's a common theme I've had through the years of the podcast is that a lot of the times your ideal avatar or your ideal guest is you. It is your problems. When you are traveling, what do you look for? What do you experience? Lack of experience when it comes to bigger families, right? I'm the seventh child of seven, I know the struggle of trying to get all of my siblings and their kids and their spouses together for a weekend, let alone a, a vacation long trip. So I love that. I have two questions for you. One, I'm going to ask first because it's selfish and I want to ask it. And then it'll be a short, short question. And then the other one going into kind of the journey of renovating this property with your husband's concussions and just the overall injuries, I'm sure that recovery process was not fun. But um, first question is, your rule of three, you found three books, three podcasts, whatever. Was Slick Talk one of those three podcasts that you listened to? Or okay, so, was I so, all the way at the bottom? Actually, no. And let me tell you how I figured out which podcast to listen to. Again, I'm, I'm super strategic. I don't like to leave things up for chance. I Googled top vacation rental podcasts. And I went awesome. through all of the lists that I came up with and like, you know, Airbnb podcasts, you know, STR podcasts. And so I had all of these lists and then I compared, <laughs> I compared who was on all of the lists and all of the ones that have overlapped. Those were the ones that I listened to and yours had overlap on all of the lists yes. that I Googled. You're like, <laughs> I'm super, I, I like to be very strategic about things. And so that was, yeah. that was how I did it is I, I Googled the best vacation rental podcasts and compared all the lists. I'm glad we were on all those lists for you. That, I mean, you that means a lot. It means we're doing, not, that's we're doing the thing. You couldn't right. have just been on one list. They had to have yeah. overlap with all of the other lists. So it had to be multiple lists all saying that you were the best. So, yes, you did yes. make the cut. Selfishly <laughs> had to ask that one. I'm curious, though, on the books. So I'm realizing that my attention span is very short when it comes to non-digital products. So if I'm reading a book or a magazine or anything like it has to be like on a computer or something else because I very much get distracted, but then I get distracted even more because I'm on a device that gets notifications like texts and phone calls. So what I've been doing recently has been listening to the audiobook while I'm reading the hard copy and I have everything on do not disturb. That's been the best and most enjoyable reading experience of my life. Even as a kid, like when I could be reading the Nancy Drew mystery books or the Hardy Boys or anything like that was complete silence and no distractions. I would still not be able to get through a page without having my thoughts run off. So this has been a great way for me. 
what books were the ones that you've been reading? And maybe do you have any that you recommend for any of the listeners, whether they're seasoned experts or if they're new, you know, getting into the newbie kind of like green thumb, not green thumb, new green horn, whatever you call it kind of experience. Yeah. So there were two and they aren't really ones that often come up, but they were more into the weeds on property management. And one was called Vacation Rental Goldmine. And I, I don't remember the name of the author, but he's located um, on the East Coast somewhere. But it was it, he had really great content on like, you know, marketing and how to target the guests. And then there was another one called Vacation Rental Mastery. And that author, his name is Rex something. I don't remember his last name. He's actually in Australia. And those were some of the ones that I came across early on before I moved over to more podcasts. I personally am a very auditory learner. Um, so when I hear something, I can remember it, which surely drives my husband crazy when I say, well, <laughs> you said, but no, like I, I have always listened to the radio, always listened to books on tape when like you had your Walkman and your cassette. So um, since I'm an auditory learner, podcasts are great for me because I just, I absorb it and I can spit it right back out. So those were some of the ones that I got started and those are the ones that have the most notes. There's another gentleman, his name is, first name is Danny and has optimized my Airbnb, which is funny. I actually don't use Airbnb, but, but it was a good book about how to use the, the ranking system and stuff like that. So those are sort of the ones that I started off with. I know now more books that I really like, I like Julie's book, Million Dollar Listing, our Million Dollar Host, um, Avery Carl's book. Those are all really good ones. Uh, the book direct playbook has been huge for our company with, and it's very strategic. <laughs> there, there's a lot of Googling in that one too. Um, so that really speaks to how I love to Google things. But those kind of entered our journey after our company was a little more established and I was working on higher level things because I was no longer a newbie at it. Yeah, no, I love that. And also while I have it here before... We jump in and for all the listeners if you don't watch any of the live stream of like the episodes that we put on linkedin facebook twitter we live stream all these the day the episode on audio goes out so go check those out so you can see the hospital the host book number two which rose our, you're names, a are, our names are right there yeah, yeah we're yeah. stuck rose at the end of the alphabet <laughs> yeah rose and i are on this second volume i guess is what you call it in the book world of hospital to host. So I think that should definitely go in the show notes for any of our listeners. I want to also get to read your story. Uh, I love that you're an audible processor and learner because that means podcasts have success when we can find people like you. But I, I want to kind of, one, we're going to touch on the Airbnb thing. I definitely think the audience listening is going to resonate highly with you on your stance in that area. But before moving on, you kind of, we've covered the podcast, the books, and I'm curious for you because your journey, like, you know, this is a pretty intense story. And, you know, I'm so glad that you and I had a podcast pre-chat before recording because I had no idea. And and I'm, again, I'm getting better at reading without, but there's no audible version of Not this yet. yet. So Not um, yet. Once, once that's there, I'll definitely be covering everybody's chapters. But, you know, hearing your story, like, having your husband go through such a tragic car accident to the amount of injuries, the memory loss, concussions, you know, that tugs on the heartstrings for, for sure. And is why I love doing the podcast and love getting to sit down with people like you to kind of talk about this, but you know, you're going through this process and not only is your husband changing careers, but he's having to pretty much rediscover things again from memory loss and all this other stuff. So as you're going through this, and I love that you found your niche of targeting big homes, private kind of multi-generational guests with this whole process, what was that like having to, did you have to do again, have that rose, I, I have to step up moment while your husband's going through this recovery, going through renovations, going through all this stuff, kids obviously at a huge factor. You are mom, you are the source of everything, especially I remember my childhood that my dad was available. I don't care. I need mom. I don't care if she's in the middle of a phone call, if she's driving, if she's got 20,000 things going on. I always went to mom. So adding that to your plate, what was it like? Just kind of maybe, I guess, walk us through your your journey of the recovery aspect while also going heavy Google and research into these podcasts and books and all the stuff going in between. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing was that he needed the time and space to 
recover and heal and to process what had happened to him. And Did he know who you were when you showed up to the hospital? So when I first arrived at the hospital, no, <laughs> mm. he didn't. And his memory started slowly coming back. Um, sometimes it would come back very fast. And that was scary for him because he remembered how earlier in the day our son had been in the car with him because he'd taken him to the dentist, but that he also knew his son wasn't there. Oh my God, is he dead? And that's, and it's like, you have to sort mm -hmm. of talk them down. Like, no, 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 you, you dropped him off at home. It's okay. Did I kill someone? This is my fault. And like, there's a lot. And it's like, no, that's not your fault. No, the other driver is going to be okay. But he needed that time and space to heal. And concussions are, they're, they're tricky business. They're tricky business and the brain needs time to heal on its own, on its own path. It's one of those times where, you know, you got to put on your big girl panties and deal with it. We have a great family. My parents live up in Northern Michigan. And when they, um, when I called them in my very serious voice, my father pulled off the side of the road and threw up. And then oh, wow. they got in the car and drove eight hours to our house to be here because we had a lot of kids. Um, but that's the kind of family that we have is that we're always there for each other. And we always try to work through things together. I know a lot of families can sometimes not always be on the same page and we don't always agree about everything, but we always try to help and support each other. And I needed to support my husband while he was recovering, while we were trying to pivot. And there's going to be this overlap. And I think a lot of people experience this when they're starting their company there's going to be an overlap where you have to do, you have to do it all. Um, he had to recover and he had to go back to that job because we needed health insurance and like grocery money. And he had to suck it up and do it until our company was in a place where he could leave so that we could, you know, provide our own health insurance and all that kind of stuff. And he probably left a little too early for our comfort. And there were some very difficult times where there wasn't any money um, and we couldn't hire anybody and the people that we were working, you know, we had to pay them, but we couldn't pay us. But you have to go through those hards to get to the other side. And a lot of people, they hit those hards and that's, that's the point at which they give up. So I've always described myself as somebody that has a really wide bandwidth. Even as a child, I was, I was too loud. I was too involved with everything. I was too busy. I was, I was just like the too much child. And my mother can definitely attest. To that. Um, but here's the thing, like now as an adult, I can harness that superpower and I can use it to achieve things that a lot of people would think a uh, homeschooling mom of six couldn't do. And I've actually found that, you know, being a mom, is not a handicap for me. Um, it's actually my secret superpower because I'm willing to work harder and longer, research deeper and, you know, network more than anybody else is willing to because I have a lot on the line. And a lot of times as mothers, we're kind of given that message that you can't be ambitious and the mom, you can't, you can't do both. I've actually found that that's, that's my superpower. All right, Slick Talkers, now for another dynamic sponsored duo of the podcast. I would love to introduce you to Vintory and Safely. About Vintory, we've had Brooke Fotts on the podcast, who is a founder, multiple times, and him and his team know numbers. They know data and they know marketing. They know how to help property managers just like you scale and grow their business by adding more inventory, aka more homes, into your rental program that drive the bottom line. For all of you listeners that want to learn how to scale and grow your inventory, you can get a free digital copy of Brooke's book called From Zero to 500 Properties in Five Years. And for an added bonus, if you would do a demo of the Vintory platform, you'll get a $50 gift card to Amazon. Now that's a sick deal. And now to touch on our friends at Safely.com. Safely.com helps property managers just like you and I protecting the homes that they manage from structural damage to content damage and of course bodily injury. This means plates, linens, cups, couches, tables, curtains, walls, and of course your guests themselves are protected. And this helps you by scaling your company in order to ensure that you are retaining owners and inventory in your program. If anything is broken or if anyone is hurt, you are able to make a claim through Safely and within three business days, you can get in instantly paid out to replace any items and settle any claims that happen on site without having to deduct from your owner's payouts. That's why I call these guys the dynamic sponsor duo. And thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. Check out their offers in the show notes and back to the episode. 
I love it. And you know, it's it's just so crazy because I I love this industry for the sense of you know coming from a house of women. I had five sisters and being ex- very much around that like mentality of I'm a mom, so who cares? I'm still working. I'm still providing for my family. I'm still building something. I'm still doing this, whatever it might be. It was never like, oh, I'm a mom. I can't go, can't go see my friends. I can't go do this. I can't do that. So hearing you just like say that as your superpower is really cool because it, it's just, it's very true. I think, and as guys might be hard for us to hear it. And I'm saying us, I'm putting myself in that realm, even though I'm used to it it's hard to hear because, you know, so, so many of us, you know, get in our head of like, well, I have to, I have to be the caregiver. I need to be the brick that holds the family together and support and da, 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 da. But in reality, it's like, no, you, you can actually like guys, it's okay to let your, your spouse or your significant other or whoever, um, actually be superwoman and let her take care of you sometimes. Um, and, and let that naturally happen. It's a gift that you are able as Rose to, be the too much child where you can focus and juggle and do so many things because I I've had conversations with a lot of people in our industry, Natalie and Tatiana. And I know the whole crew of us that was in at level up your listing, the fun conversation was we would be talking about our stories or what we're doing and da, 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 da. And then people would be like, and how long have you guys been doing this? And someone would be, Oh, nine months. And then somebody would be a year and a half, two years, whatever. And then you guys have accomplished in the triple speed than of what someone normally would accomplish this time, the stuff in, in, in a time sense. And I'm butchering that sentence, but the amount of stuff that you guys have accomplished in such a short period of time would take people five years. What Rose has done from that moment of we're going to change or we're going to renegotiate our, our structure here to where you are today is something what could take some people a lifetime to do. So it is such a superpower. And I, I love stories like yours and i love that you are like here to tell it because it's so encouraging that you know we sometimes can look down on ourselves like oh man we haven't accomplished this and comparison can be the thief of joy right so we're comparing ourselves to other people who may have more money or more properties or more whatever and have this crazy lifestyle but it's like you know you guys are we're all accomplishing stuff at a significant rate significant compared to what most people can do in 10 years so you know, it's so cool to, to see that. And so I guess going into another question for you, you know, reading your bio, I guess I'll give some context to this question, reading your bio and your, your guest fill out form it. We have all guests do, you know, I get to see that your kids are involved. You, you, you have them part of the experience. So kind of walk us through that superpower and what it looks like behind the scenes. Cause you're not just like juggling the kids at home. You're at properties, you're managing housekeepers, maintenance, probably purursing new or building new properties. I know you're building a new one. So walk us through it. What, what what's that, that day to like? day look like? Yeah. Yeah. When I get I, I get that question a lot because I think people not about really sure how we homeschool kids and run a business. And so it's important for everyone listening and watching to know that my husband and I both work on our company full time. Like he does the CFO stuff and I do the CEO stuff. But we are a team And we are a team, not just in work, but we are a team as a family. So when I say that I homeschool the kids, it's not really accurate because we homeschool the kids and we do it together. And he loves it just as much as I do. (laughs) Um, And so that's the number one thing is that I'm not on my own doing this. We are a team and it's so much more fulfilling because we're doing it as a family. So a lot of times when we're doing school, we have sort of a we have a schedule and a structure because, of course, we do of, of how we get our school tasks done. So a lot of times when we're doing school, you know, the kids will have our school table and uh, the kids will be on both sides of the table working on their schoolwork. And I'll be at the head of the table with my computer doing my my work, not my schoolwork, my work work. And I'm there answering questions and helping them out with stuff. A lot of times when people think about school or homeschool, they picture like the teacher standing at the whiteboard, writing facts down for the kids to like absorb by osmosis. But that's not how it works. <laughs> uh, I've never, I've never stood at a whiteboard and, and, you know, wrote one plus one equals two. Um, and my, my kids are, they're very busy and they like to do a lot of stuff. And so like learning isn't like that. It's much more 
independent for the older kids, usually by the time they're in second or third grade and their reading skills are well enough established. A lot of them, they do most of their schoolwork at their pace in the way that they find comfortable. And then we go over the things together. They do math on their their level and they do their grammar and they're reading at their level. And then we do a lot of other classes together as a family. We'll be doing science together. We'll be doing history together. So we do have a general structure to our day of when we're doing school. If I need to go out to one of the properties to get an inspection done, then my husband's going to switch in and he's going to be driving that chip while I'm gone. If he, you know, it's the end of the month and he needs to close out the books for the end of the month, then I'm going to make sure that I'm home and I'm pushing the school stuff through. So we do a lot, a lot of communication, a lot of spreadsheets with the schedule on who does what when. Sometimes it's getting up earlier to get things out of the way. Sometimes it's doing things at the end of the school day. And see, the great thing about homeschooling is that I can do it whenever I want. So a lot of times we think school has to happen during the day. So sometimes it works better to kick the kids outside in the afternoon and let them play outside while I knock out some schoolwork. And then after dinner, before bed, do schoolwork during that time frame. So that it, it gives us more of that freedom and independence. Um, my kids are also very good about picking up their schoolwork and taking it where they need to go. So if I need to be cleaning a house, they can grab their stuff. They can sit at the table at one of our properties while I'm cleaning and they can get their schoolwork done. They don't have to learn in one spot. So um, one of the things that we're really looking forward to is doing some travel at the end of the month for going to the short stay summit. And so my kids are all, they're not going to the short stay summit, but they're going to go, they're going to go with us over to London. They're going to learn so much. And school looks like lots of different things and learning looks like lots of different things. And one of the things that I always try to use as like a litmus test when we're doing school, is there an adult equivalent to just school activity? So if you think about like you have a math class and in a regular school, you have a math lesson and you do it and then you have to like wait that whole period and, you know, maybe you have to take work home. There's no like adult equivalent to that. Like when you have a real job, you do the job and then you move on to the next job. And if you don't finish the job during your work hours, that's called overtime. So I always try to think about structuring their life in a way that it makes sense in an adult equivalent. I love that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. And it's helping them to be more independent and be more self-starting. And they also have the time and freedom to learn things that they find very interesting. My daughter is a brilliant signer. She's been taking sign language classes for five years. Wouldn't be an option for her in a regular school in the school district. My oldest son, he speaks Chinese, which blows my mind. He's been doing Chinese for five years. He's a 12-year-old. And I can't even believe it. We were watching a movie and he was like, that character isn't right for that. That character means this, not that. I'm like, oh, wow. How did you do that? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, yeah. like my, my third and fourth kids, they are, they are like budding engineers. They can make anything out of Legos. I mean, it, it's <laughs> truly astonishing. And it, it is really great to see them be able to follow their passions. Yeah. And do the things that they're interested in while I am also following my passions and doing things I'm interested in. And we're all doing that together. And it yeah. would be very hard to do that in a different type of industry. Well, it's so cool because, man, you're getting me so excited because I, I struggled. It. I struggled in school. I, I was homeschooled till third grade. I came into third grade not knowing my times tables, not knowing anything. I, I was just like homeschool to me was just playing and not really listening to my mom and dad and all that stuff. So, and, and, you know, my parents work traditional jobs and my mom is a massage therapist. And so like, I never really got to see entrepreneurship until way later in life. And so for you to, you know, a lot of the times on the show, we, we talk about, you know, leading by example, what is, you know, good leadership practices and, you know, a big conversation that we have is, you know, are you born or made and are you born a certain way or are you eventually molded into what you become? And, you know, everyone's answer is a little bit different, but for you to be the mom that gets to lead by example in the sense of doing what's driving your passion, what's feeling you, what's filling your cup, it's hard to give when you don't have anything to give. And a lot of the times we, we look at people to take from, to fill up our cup when in general, actually you could fill up your cup in the sense of doing something that actually 
naturally feels it, which I could tell from getting to know you and getting to have conversations. You know, this is an industry that you are passionate about. And this is something that, so I, I, I'm very excited. I love that. I love the way you're raising your kids and looking for adult equivalents and setting them up for success to not have like a culture shock when they turn 18 and they're paying rent and working a job or starting their own business or whatever it might be. So it's so cool. I love that. I, I'm just going to make that comment. So there's no question tied to it. It's just, I, I love it. I think it's awesome. And I know it's not for everybody. Like if you, if you feel like homeschooling is not part of your journey, like that's okay. And you need to do what's working best for you and for your family. And I know people that you know, they try homeschooling, they struggle with it, and then they feel really guilty because maybe it didn't work for their family. And that's okay. For us, it works really well with our personalities and our lifestyles. And I also have that background in education, which makes other people feel better about me homeschooling my kids. But this, I, I learned early on the secret to being a good teacher. And do you know what that secret is? No, I yeah, don't. You, have to, you have to work hard. That's really what it is. <laughs> there's, there, there's no point in teacher education where you go into the back room and they tell you what the hokey pokey is all about. Like that never yeah. happens. Oh, if wow. you want to be a good teacher, you work hard. There you go. There's the secret. <laughs> so, you know, since I have that background in education and I knew it's, you know, pedagogy is great and all of that kind of stuff. And I have a lot of that. But you know what? It comes down to hard work. And it's like that in lots of different things in life. This is what yeah. works for our family. I love it. I love it. It's such a good message for everyone to hear. So I want to go into a, a quick shift into the conversation. You mentioned you don't listen on Airbnb, which got probably a lot of our listeners' ears all perked up in a good way. I definitely started in this industry coming from hotels and immediately got into the traditional vacation rental brand, right? The the moving mountains of the world, the Casa goes, the Vacasas, you name those types of brands versus the what we are seeing on the side of Airbnb hosts where they just host on Airbnb and figure out there's this whole new world and industry behind it. And that it's actually pre existed pre Airbnb. It's been around for 20, 30, 40 years. So with that, you know, going into your day to day, you've talked about your responding to emails and guests and answering questions and you're not on the platform. So how did you, when you got started, did you list on the platforms initially? to build traffic and revenue? Or did you immediately out the gate build out your family's place, which is your brand and, and your guys's company, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. So you built out your family's place and did you immediately get into that realm of book direct and owning your guest information and controlling the experience in the beginning or how that all shape? And if it started on OTAs, how did you build to where you guys are independent from them? So we we did start on the OTAs. We started listing on both Verbo and Airbnb. But when we listed on Verbo, it was still VRBO. We're old school, you know. <laughs> we we were on Verbo before it was Verbo. So we started that way. And as we were growing and we were getting bigger, more expensive homes, and we were noticing that the quality of the guests that we were getting from Airbnb was decidedly lower than the quality of guests that we were getting from Verbo. That was a pattern that we had noticed. You know, different areas are more Verbo, different areas are more B&B. &B, but for us, the quality of guests that we were getting through that platform was not the same. So as we were moving into a bigger, more expensive house, we said, let's test this out. There's the science teacher in me. Let's just list this house on Verbo and see what happens. And if we don't, if we don't chill it up, then we'll put it on the Airbnb too. And lo and behold, we filled our calendar very successfully just being on the one platform. So as we grew and we added new homes, we just, we eventually stopped using Airbnb entirely and we were on Verbo. And that was, at that point, we were pretty well established. We had three properties. My husband was leaving his job. I have always wanted to build what I call a real business. And if you don't have your own website and if you don't have a book direct game, I'm sorry, you might not be a real business. And so that was when I practiced my rule of three to learn about how bigger, well-established vacation rental companies, you know, folks down in Florida, folks in the Outer Banks, how are they running their businesses? Because I want to be a real business and I want to learn the lessons that they have learned 
so that I can build our company into a real business. And that was where we started going down the track of branding, coming up with our brand, your family's place, because just through the process of brand development, you're telling your current guests and your future potential guests a lot about who you are, what your homes are, and what their stay is going to be. All of that is just communicated through the brand. And that was when we were, my husband was leaving his job to do this full time. And it was, I was not willing to take the risk that one nasty guest, one, you know, lying person or, you know, somebody trashing the house or something like that, that that was going to cut off all of our rent of, uh, revenue. Like, I'm not going to take that risk. So that was when I was working very hard and learning about marketing and book direct strategies. I listened to all of Mark's, Mark's interviews, all the podcasts and read the book direct playbook, had the highlighter out, all of that kind of stuff. And I really wanted to build an independent brand that would attract the right guests to us and start building that long-term brand loyalty. And so we do still have our homes on Durbo, but this year we are 80% direct off of our website. And not only are we 80% direct, we are 40% repeat guests. Guest retention is super important to me because when we find a good guest, we want to keep that guest. And so I read a lot of books, listened to a lot of books on guest retention, you know, uh, marketing to your existing guest, all of that kind of stuff, and implemented a wide range of strategies to entice them to continue to come back. And when they do come back to book direct and that that we have really seen that pay off this year where 80 percent of our guests are booking directly off of our website. And a lot of those people are folks that have stayed with us in the past and by doing that, I'm creating a different type of value. I have revenue that comes in. I own our homes, and so I have value in the real estate. But by building a brand, I'm creating a separate type of value that in the future, uh, now I don't want to work forever, I'm creating a separate type of value that can be monetized in the future. Yeah, I love that. And you know, it's, it's so cool because the amount of money you're probably saving from OTA fees and all the other stuff on top of that with equity and real estate value with direct business. Again, repeating the fact of no OTA fees and, or at least 80% no OTA fees. And then going into, you know, the other revenue streams you're able to control through that with a brand, you know, adding experiences. And then I've heard your cookies are quite amazing. I, I know you're probably not capitalizing on those, but Oh, they are very good. Sometimes the guests will ask for the recipe and I'll send it to them, but I tell them they only, they really taste the best when they're in our homes. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> you can make this at home, but it's just going to A, either make you want to come back and probably yeah. sooner than you wanted to come back or B, it's not going to feel the same. And then you're going to really be upset because then you're not at our home staying. That's right. Now. That's right. Well, and a good chef never gives away all of their secrets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's all, on, it's all in the road, the rose touch. That's the right. Well, and we like to say that being in our homes is like a warm chocolate chip cookie. And the cookies are <laughs> very large. They are oversized cookies um, because a big cookie is way better than a little cookie because uh, they're better that way. Duh. But that's what we like to say now. Chocolate chip cookies are the king of all cookies. Oatmeal raisins are good and they're nice. But after you have one, you still wish you'd had a chocolate chip cookie. So that's the type of experience that our guests want to have when they are arriving. They want to have that warm chocolate chip cookie experience. Hey, you're saying it. We're thinking it. We've been thinking that you, you, you took the words right out of our mouths. So I love that. I think it's so true. <laughs> Even if you had a raisin oatmeal cookie, you still wish you had a chocolate they're chip. They're okay. One. They're okay. But it's sort yeah, of like, yeah. they're okay. But what they're, you really wanted it. was chocolate. Yeah. I love yeah. it. No, it's so good. So Rose, kind of give us a, a quick overview cap here now. So how many years from start to finish or start to today? Because obviously you're not finished. There's always more to do. Start to today, how many years have you been doing it? What property count are you at? And I know, correct me if I'm wrong, you're in the process of building like your dream it's property. Big. Yeah. 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 So give us, get, kind of catch us up to where we are today. Yeah. We started in 2017, which I believe in this industry makes us pretty old school. 
Uh, so we know we know what we know what 2017, 2018, and 2019 feels like. So we're doing great in 2023. We we have realistic expectations. So right now we have three homes. Two of them we purchased. One that we built from the ground up, and then we are finishing off our fourth home right now. It has um, it's a main house. It has about 4,000 square feet. It has a bonus space above the garage as like a, a separate apartment. So you can throw the Love kids it. up there or, you know, yeah. you know, the people that you don't want in the main house. And then there is a separate romantic couples retreat. Um, I can't do anything ordinary. So it's designed like a Victorian greenhouse. It's called the conservatory. So it has a little outside, inside, inside, outside feel. I'm very excited about that. It has a huge is there is there a good amount there. of spacing between the main yeah. house? So there's, okay. there's about like, you know, like 7,500 feet, but then we're planting a whole bunch of spruce trees in between. So there's gotcha. like a little spruce forest. So that property, it's called Middle Haven. It's on 32 acres. So wow. when we talk like land, like that's the kind of land that I want, like big yeah. land. We have two ponds because why not put in two ponds on the side of a hill in the middle of the woods? I mean, why not? There's a waterfall that connects the two ponds and um, we have a basketball court there. So you have your own private basketball court. We have hiking trails throughout the whole property. It's designed kind of like a, like a woodland cottage. It feels a little English. Um, I like yeah. to hit nostalgic notes when it comes to design because everyone has an idea of what that feels like. So we have the kids' bedroom downstairs. You actually go through a wardrobe to get into the children's bedroom because who okay. everyone's red. Everyone's red Narnia. <laughs> and we all want to go through a wardrobe to something fun. So the kids' bedroom, you actually am having a wardrobe built. It's it, It'll look like it's 100 years old, but it opens up and then you walk through there and that's how you go into the kids' bedroom. So there's a lot of fun fun little magical surprises in there. But we are at the end of construction and I'm ready to be done now. I'm ready to be <laughs> I, done. I can imagine. Yeah. You're like, I see the finish line and it needs to get here today. I totally agree. That's awesome. I, I love it. And just kind of hearing all the things you guys are building into the property, the experience, uh, the different types of situations. I love uh, the apartment above the garage. I love the Victorian, you know, romantic couples retreat. There's just so much I love. And one of my notes before we even hopped on the call, I, I took a note of like, I love that you and your family have embraced the hospitality side of vacation rentals. I, I think so often we hear how many properties you have, what's your portfolio look like? You know, what's your, this, what's that? Da, da, da. And those are all great. Like these are, you know, to each their own, we all have different goals and lifestyles and end games that we want to get to. So that's all great. But you know, the, the embracing of hospitality is just the special I think secret sauce. And that's why obviously we're, we're a hospitality podcast, but for you, I just, I think it's exactly who you are, like your, your personality type and just getting to hear your story. Like, I think just, you don't, again, it comes back to like that, the too much child. You just, you can't leave it ordinary, right? You, you can't no, do I can't. it. I can't. No. And, and that's yeah. so good. That's so good. I think more people need to embrace that if they have been told they're too much or they're too extreme or they're too passionate or whatever, too, too, whatever. So it's just so cool to hear. And, you know, we're, we're running out of time and and we have to, you know, kind of wrap up this episode, but I, I would love to uh, ask you the question uh, that we've been asking all guests recently from a guest before you. So the guest before you is Alex Shapiro from Can Monkey. And right now the question is, what is a failure that you had in your business later in the game that you wish you had earlier? So something that maybe that happened recently that you wish you had happened in the first year or two, maybe, give or take. Yeah. So uh, something that happened recently. So I don't think that we had our pricing nailed down mm -hmm. appropriately. Also, the last couple of years have been wild when it comes to rentals. And yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so we had some rentals last year at the cottage at Maple Pond, which is a gorgeous property on a private lake. And people were renting it way too low. <laughs> and my husband's like, we can't be renting this out for $300 a night. Like, what are we doing here? And so that was a, a failure that we had. I wish that we had failed earlier because that was when we got dynamic pricing up and running. 
And so mm-hmm. we see a, we actually have a 30% increase year on year, even though everyone's talking about how, you know, 2023 is so scary, we're actually 30% higher this year than we were last year. Now, occupancy is the same. So now I understand the importance of dynamic pricing, because if you're not using it, you might as well get all your cash and take it out to the fire pit and light it on fire. <laughs> so then I've had that conversation with a couple of people around my area recently who are not using dynamic pricing. I said, you might as well light your money on fire. And it's wow. so easy to use. And I wish that I would have gotten that turned on because we would have done even better in those wild years of 2020 through 2022. For sure. I love that. Now, if you had to ask a question to the next guest without me telling you who they are and what their experience is, and it doesn't have to be business or hospitality related, you could pick anything. Uh, what would that question be? So my question for ten, for the next person is, if you asked your 10-year-old self what you would be when you grow up, are you that thing? Um, are you that what did you What did you think that you were going to be when you grew up? We ask our kids that a lot. I always knew I wanted to help people. I didn't know what that meant, but I feel like I'm doing that. Yeah, no, I love it. I think you are. I think you are. You're, you're hitting the nail on the head right there. Yeah. And now we're obviously going to link everything in the show notes, but where can people find you? Number one place you would love people to, to connect and reach out. Yep. Well, I have two different uh, social media channels for different types of content. So if you are interested in staying with us or learning about our properties, we're at your family's place on Instagram, Facebook. Um, if you're interested in learning more about like the lifestyle of hosting and being a mom, I have a, a separate Instagram page called Hosting in the Motherhood. Um, I separated those things out because future potential guests might not be interested in learning about Minoan or Price Labs <laughs> or that kind of stuff. And they don't really care about that. They just want to know how to book their vacation. So I have different pages with different kinds of content. So it's at your family's place for our vacation rentals and it's hosting in the motherhood or the lifestyle of doing all this crazy stuff. All this crazy stuff. I love all it. All this crazy stuff. It's a smart approach. I like the you separate the the two. It's it's always you, you know two different audiences and yeah, smart move for your guests. So love that. Rose, it has been so amazing to chat with you today and to hear your story and to ask you the questions that were running through my head that I'm sure anyone who's listening was probably thinking or hopefully thinking the same. So thank you so much. We're going to put everything in the show notes. So any of our listeners, subscribers, viewers, any of you slick talkers out there, we would love for you to support Rose, reach out, give her comments of support or ask her any questions that maybe you're struggling with. If you haven't built or bought your own properties yet, I'm sure she is a great resource and I will probably be leaning into her more often than not now (laughs) due to the fact that I would love to own one. So thank you so much, Rose. And for all of you listeners and viewers out there, we'll see you again next week. Thank you so much for listening and thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast possible. We hope you enjoyed the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week.